Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, MIT Nano um, Exploration Seminar. Uh, my name is Rona Han. I'm the Associate Professor of uh, MIT ECS Department. Uh, so today, it's my uh, great pleasure uh, to uh, um, introduce uh, Xi Bi Chen uh, to give the talk uh, towards high angular resolution 4D radar imaging at sub terahertz. So here is a brief uh, introduction uh, uh, bio for CB. Uh, so CB received his uh, bachelor and a master degrees from uh, Tsinghua University uh, in 2017 and also 2020. Uh, so since uh, 2020, he joined uh, the EECS department of uh, MIT as a PhD student. And I have the privilege of uh, working uh, with him as his advisor. So his current research interests includes uh, terahertz uh, integrated electronics and systems, terahertz imaging and sensing, and also CMOS uh, electromagnetics. So uh, Xi Bi was the uh, re recipient of the ICCC 2020 Student Travel Grant Award, and also the Analog Device Outstanding Student Designing Award. Uh, so before the seminar starts, uh, here are also some, uh, uh, some information. Uh, so basically, uh, the audience can ask the participants uh, questions uh, during the Q&A sessions. Uh, so please don't ask the question during the session, uh, during the seminar. Uh, so you can either ask the question uh, live by raising your virtual hand in the Zoom, or you can leave your question in this uh, Q&A panel. All right. Uh, OK, so now the floor is uh, CB. OK, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. My name is Xi Chen from ECS MIT. The title of my talk today is Towards High Angular Resolution 4D Radar Imaging at Subterahertz. So here is the outline. I'm going to start with a brief introduction for high angular resolution 4D radar imaging. And then I'm going to continue with uh, showing you two representative works from our group regarding this topic. And then I will end up with some conclusions. So when we talk about imaging and sensing applications, if we just draw a frequency spectrum in here, then on the left side, we have these microwave or millimeter wave radars. For these microwave radars, uh, because their center frequency is low, so usually they need to have a large physical size if they want to have a very high angular resolution. And also because of the low center frequency, they usually just have limited bandwidth. And then on the right side, uh, we have this visible range. Uh, or optics. In here, we have LIDARs. So for LIDARs, because their center frequency is pretty high, so it's usually not a problem for them to have a high angular resolution with a relatively small physical size, and also the bandwidth could be decent. But the problem for LIDAR is they suffer from those bad weather and strong light interference, like shown in these pictures. And then in the middle range, we have this sub terahertz region. So in here, uh, we can really get the benefits from both sides of the spectrum. So we don't suffer from those bad weather or strong light interference problem, but at the same time, we still got decent bandwidth and good angular resolution with small size. But of course, there are also challenges using sub terahertz. So as we know, all know, we have these microelectronic devices degradation from left to right, and we also have these laser and optical devices degradation from right to left. So we see that in this middle part, we really have both great opportunities and challenges for doing sub terahertz radars. And that's why this topic is interesting and that's why we're doing it. So to further give you more intuition uh, about why we uh, push the frequency to sub terahertz for high angular resolution applications, here I just show you a comparison uh, between the size of the antenna aperture and the operating frequency uh, you use for the, for the vehicle uh, applications. So, Suppose uh, you have an antenna array operating at 24 gigahertz and you are targeting at a one degree resolution in 2D angular domain. Then probably you need to have a antenna aperture size uh, as large as 60 centimeter by 60 centimeter. And this is how big it compares with a car. But if you can push this frequency to 265 gigahertz, then you just immediately shrink the size of the antenna into six centimeter by six centimeter. And as you can see here, this small size is apparently more uh, feasible uh, when it pairs with a car. And another practical problem for these massive large scale antenna arrays is that 
in the traditional phase array or MIMO array scenarios, uh, they all suffer from this so-called half wavelength dilemma because in order to eliminate the grating lobes of the antenna array, you have to confine all your uh, active circuits uh, which feeds each antenna element within this half lambda by half lambda area. And usually it's pretty hard to uh, you know, well fit all those uh, active circuits uh, inside this small area. And that's why MIMO people uh, propose this smart idea of a virtual array. So instead of having a dense array physically, they just have a sparse array like this. And then equivalently, they can get uh, this equivalent dense array effect uh, for the round trip radar detection. But if we're talking about something like one degree of angular resolution, even if you apply this concept of virtual array, you still have uh, many channels as large as like 100 TX and 100 RX. So you still have the problem to feeding those active circuits behind each antenna element. And also uh, these a uh, large number of channels will cause some problems in the signal processing. So in here, uh, we would like to you know, present uh, some uh, different scenarios regarding uh, this limit. And just in case uh, some of the audience uh, don't know uh, what is the specific four dimensions for 4D radar imaging, I just put a figure in here uh, just to explain what is the actual uh, four dimensions we're talking about. So when we say 4D radar imaging, uh, the first dimension we're talking about is the distance. So basically the range uh, between the object and your radar. And the second one is uh, called direction. Uh, this one is actually the azimuth direction, uh, which is pointing in or pointing out of this uh, screen. And the third one is the velocity, uh, the velocity of the object. So this can be acquired by the Doppler effect. And finally, the last one is the vertical information or the height information uh, of the object. Uh, which is actually the elevation direction uh, of the uh, radar. Uh, so instead of the traditional scenario uh, for 4D radar imaging, here we would like to decouple this original 4D problem into two sets of 2D problems. So uh, one set of the problem is we just uh, 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 discussed about this vertical uh, detection or elevation direction detection and with this azimuth direction detection. So that's one set of problem. And the other set of problem is we just discussed about this distance and velocity detection. And for the first set of problem, we would like to show you a 260 gigahertz 98 by 98 element CMOS refractory work from our group. And this work is done by my colleague, Nathan Mara, uh, and is published in this year's ISCC. So for refractories, you can treat it as a spatial feeding version of phase array. So instead of having uh, all those complicated active circuits behind each antenna element, you just have one single transceiver feed in the free space, which shines the wave on the whole aperture. And then each antenna inside this array is essentially just like a reflector. And if you can carefully tune the phase distribution across the whole array, you can have a well beam collimation in the far field for the reflected wave. So you can use this narrow pencil beam in the far field to do the detection in both azimuth and elevation directions, uh, basically doing 2D beam theory. And apparently by implementing this scenario, we decouple the design of the large scale antenna array and the design of those complicated active circuits. So in this case, we do not have the half lambda dilemma, which is suffered uh, by uh, most traditional phased arrays and MIMO arrays. And moreover, by decoupling the design of these two parts, we can further enable some potential hybrid implementation technology. So for example, we can use 3.5 process to do this transceiver design so we got higher output power, but at the same time, we still use the cheap CMOS process uh, to uh, produce this large scale refactor array. And this slide shows uh, our recent work on this 265 gigahertz CMOS refactor array prototype. And again, this work is done by my colleague, Nathan Morrow and published in this year's ICCC. So this reflector array contains 14 by 14 tiled CMOS chips, and each chip is four millimeter by four millimeter large. And within each chip, you have seven by seven antenna array uh, as a subarray. So in total, this whole reflector array contains 98 by 98 antenna elements. And all these chips and the PCBs are connected together through bound wires. And this whole thing is based on Intel 22 nanometer FinSet CMOS process. 
To further show you the principle of this refractory, if we zoom in into one single antenna element, we see that we have one patch antenna with several probe feeds. And suppose we have a instant wave linear polarized uh, in this red direction. Then essentially, this antenna will absorb this wave, and then the, the wave will propagate through this P1 via and reach this T junction here. And in this T junction, it will see two identical RF switches on both sides. So now let's suppose we turn on the switch on the left, but turn off the switch on the right, the wave will just propagate towards the left and go through this P3 via, and then ray radiate out through the same patch antenna. But now since the P3 via is on this edge, the reflected wave will be in the orthogonal polarization compared to the instant case. So in this blue polarization. And now if we turn off the switch on the left, but turn on the switch on the right, the wave will experience nearly the same path, but now it goes towards the right and experiencing this P2 via. So the reflected wave will still be in the blue polarization, but because of this geometrical flipping of P2 and P3 vias, you will have a 180 degree phase difference compared to this case. So you can see just by controlling the switch state of these two RF switches, we can generate a 180 degree phase difference uh, for the reflected wave uh, between these two cases. And this is what we call a one-bit phase quantization. So the reason we're calling it quantization is because instead of having a continuous zero to 360 degree phase tuning, instead we just have two discrete phase states, zero degree and 180 degree. So now, suppose in the array calculation, you want one antenna element to have, let's say, 200 degree of phase shifting. Then you probably have to represent that 200 degree just by 180 degree since you only have two phase states. So you immediately got 20 degree of phase error. And this phase error is happening for most of the antenna elements in this array. Then a question immediately pops up, which is what is the consequence after we have all these phase errors? Unfortunately, uh, statistically, we can show that uh, if you have large enough antenna numbers inside this array, uh, this one bit phase error is actually not a big deal. So as you can see in this simulated result, uh, if you only have five by five elements for this array, this one bit phase error tends to give you a weird shape of radiation pattern with this high side lobes. But once you increase the antenna numbers to the level of 100 by 100, you actually can still form a very nice uh, sharp pencil beam at the desired direction. And all those uh, phase errors tend to be flattened out in all these side lobes. So the overall side load level is still low. So this basically shows that as long as you have large number of antenna elements inside this refractory, the one bit phase error is not a big deal. And in our measurement, we also see that uh, we have this uh, beautiful pencil beams in both E plane and H plane. And we are able to do this 2D beam steering in azimuth and elevation directions. And the steering range uh, is larger than minus 60 degree to plus 60 degree. And if we zoom in into one main beam, we see that the beam width is around one degree. This means that we have one degree of angular resolution uh, for our uh, refractory. And one attractive feature for using CMOS process to do this refractory is that we really have the luxury to implement all those in-unit memory behind each single antenna element. And this in-unit memory feature enabled some unique operations compared to other off-chip version reflect arrays. So one operation for that is the beam squint correction. So beam squint is a problem uh, which happens for most of the antenna arrays. So it is like if you have a fixed phase pattern on this array, but you change your operating frequency, then in the far field, you will see that you have a slight shifting uh, of your uh, beam direction. As you can see from this measured result, if you change the frequency from 260 gigahertz to 270 gigahertz, then you will have like one to two degree of uh, beam shifting in the angular domain. Usually this small beam difference is not a big problem, but now since we are having a very high angular resolution, the beam width itself is just like one degree. So this shifting becomes a problem. And in order to correct this, what we can do is we just utilize this in-unit memory feature and pre-compute all the correct phase states at different frequencies and pre-store all these data inside the in-unit memory. 
And then if we doing if we're doing like wideband frequency sweeping like FMCW chirps uh, at different sub frequency range, we just read out those data uh, automatically and correct uh, this beam squint. And as you can see, uh, after this correction, uh, even if you change the frequency, we still have a perfect aligned main beam. Another interesting feature enabled by this in-unit memory uh, 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 stuff is uh, we can have the time dithering. So uh, usually when you design an antenna array, you can always choose to change the common phase reference of the whole array. And after you do the one bit quantization, uh, different common phase reference will give you different distribution of the phase errors across the whole array. And the result of that is you still have the same main beam, but the side lobes becomes very different. And as you can see in this animation, uh, when you change this delta phi number, which is a common phase reference, you will have the same main beam, but you will have very different uh, side lobes. And now you can imagine that if we extract a few frames inside this animation and average them out, the main beam stays the same, but the side lobes tends to just average out and you've got a lower side lobe level. And this is called time dithering. And this is indeed what we saw in the real measurement. So if we don't do this time dithering, we got this red curve for the measured radiation pattern. But if we do a 4x time dithering, meaning that we extract four frames in this animation and average them out, uh, we got this blue curve. So the side lobe levels is much better. And moreover, it is even comparable to the simulated pattern when there is no phase error at all. And this time measuring feature is something we uh, keep implementing inside our actual radar demo. Okay, so now I can show you uh, the actual radar imaging demo using this reflect array. So as you can see here, if we put several targets in front of this reflect array, at the same time on the screen, we can show that uh, the location of different uh, objects and we are able to distinguish the small angular distance between these two adjacent objects. And this is another short video. So uh, we can have this three dimension uh, uh, demonstration of your target and also showing the range. And because we're using sub terahertz waves, it is able to penetrate through these dielectric pores and also uh, the human clothes. So uh, basically this can be applied for some potential security applications. Okay, so that's enough for the reflector ray part. Uh, then for the remaining two dimensions of the uh, radar imaging, the distance direction and the velocity dimension, uh, I'm gonna show another work from our group, which is done by myself. This is a 140 gigahertz CMOS transceiver, and this is also published in this year's ICCC. So once we have the reflector ray for the whole system, uh, we immediately thought about how we should feed that reflector ray. And when we are uh, feeding the, the, the reflector ray with the transceiver, there's a practical issue we must concern, uh, which is the beam misalignment. So suppose you have a very high gain lens or reflector ray in here, and you, you are pairing it uh, with a TX antenna and an RX antenna. Then based on geometrical optics, this small offset of the TX RX antenna will give you a beam misalignment in the far field, as you can see in this radiation pattern as well. So now for the round trip radar detection, if you only use the intersection point of these two radiation patterns, you already lose a lot of gain just because you have this beam misalignment. So this is a problem. That's why uh, when you have this high angular resolution application, people prefer to use monostatic transceiver instead. So monostatic transceiver uh, basically means you have one single shared antenna interface between your TX and RX. So you only have, uh, you have a perfect alignment between these two uh, antennas. Basically they're the same antenna. Uh, but the problem is uh, you're gonna uh, need a good isolation uh, between your TX circuit and RX circuit, and you're gonna need a full duplexer to achieve that. And remember, we are talking about this issue under sub terahertz level. At this high frequency, currently the only way people can do this full duplexer is to implement this directional or hybrid couplers. But the problem for these couplers is once you use that, you immediately got a 3 dB intrinsic insertion loss in TX and another 3 dB insertion loss in RX. So for the round trip, you got 6 dB of loss. That's a huge problem. So what we're gonna do here is 
we're going to propose a sub terahertz monostatic transceiver, uh, which has a good isolation, but we don't have any coupler loss penalty. Another practical problem we need to consider for this uh, transceiver is, uh, since we're using on-chip antenna, we need to decide whether we use front-side or back-side radiation. There are pros and cons for both uh, cases. For backside radiation, you have a better matching bandwidth for on-chip antenna because of the nice traveling wave structure on the backside, but it comes with the high cost of the implementation uh, for silicon lamps, as we all know. And then for front-side radiation, it's usually more difficult to match the on-chip antenna in a very wide bandwidth, but you have the opportunity to use the low-cost dielectric lamps and even 3D printed lamps. And in this work, uh, we choose to use the front side radiation, and we have uh, some mechanism to solve uh, this matching bandwidth problem for the on-chip antenna. To show you the basic principles of this transceiver design, we start with a key observation of electromagnetic waves. So suppose uh, we have a turnstile antenna with this quadrature phase speed. Then this will generate a right-handed circular polarization in the far field. And then when this wave is heating a metallic object and reflects back for the reflected wave, the rotation of the E vector will not change, but the propagation direction will be reversed. So in that case, instead of RHCP, you've got a left-handed circular polarization wave, LHCP. So basically these two wave modes give you two channels. And to further transfer this into circuit, in the feed line of the turnstile antenna, we add a 90 degree phase shifter in one path, like this red path. So now in the TX case, if you have a common mode feed at this interface, this 90 degree phase shifting will generate this quadrature phase feed and thus the RHCP wave. For the receiving case, when the LHCP wave is received by the antenna, in the red path, the wave actually experiences this 90 degree phase shifting twice in total. So compared to the blue path, you now have a 180 degree phase difference. So now it becomes differential mode. And to further utilize this common and differential mode, we propose this comp compact, fully passive duplexer structure, which contains two slots. So in the TX case, since the wave mode inside the two slots are common mode, so the RX bridge in here cannot extract any power because the E vector inside the two slots are canceling with each other. So we achieve a perfect isolation from TX to RX. And then in the RX case, now the wave is differential inside the two slots. So the RX bridge can extract the power because the vectors are adding up together. But at the TX port, the original grounded CPW structure now just serves as an equivalent short for the differential mode. So if we intentionally choose this lens to be quarter wave lens, at this RX bridge, we just see an equivalent open to the left. So the RX port really cannot see any effects from the TX port. So in that case, we eliminate any potential insertion loss penalty for this full duplexer. So overall, based on these principles, we can achieve a full duplexing uh, with one single shared antenna interface, but there is no uh, inherent coupler loss. And after showing you the principles, uh, I can show you the antenna design for this chip. So we use uh, what we call holo turnstile antenna uh, in this chip. And the antenna layer is on the top, and at the bottom of the uh, substrate, we have the PCB reflector. And if we choose the silicon substrate uh, to have the thickness of quarter wavelength, the reflected wave from the PCB reflector can add up in phase with the original front side radiation of the antenna. So in total, we got a efficient front side radiation. And as for the uh, antenna topology, compared to the traditional turnstile antenna, we have these extra holes in the middle of each fan. And the reason we're having these holes is because if you look at the current distribution of the traditional turnstile antenna, you see a strong mutual coupling between the antenna layer and the feed line below it. And now if you dig a hole in the middle of each fan, you can eliminate this mutual coupling. And moreover, because we're using front side radiation, having less metal on the top layer also means less blockage of the reflected wave from the PCB reflector. So doing these holes can also increase the antenna radiation efficiency. And as we can see in this uh, simulated result, indeed, by having these holes, we can increase the efficiency by about 10%. And overall, we achieve the radiation efficiency for this antenna around 32%.
Once we have the antenna, another practical problem pops up, uh, which is the antenna basically serves as the very first object you see from your radar. But this is really the kind of object you don't want to see. It's like a fake object. Uh, so the antenna reflection or antenna mismatch will give you extra leakage to the RX port. And moreover, uh, this antenna mismatch or antenna reflection is usually dispersive. So at different frequency, you have different response for this extra RX leakage. So we really want to eliminate this as well. So that's why we further implement this adaptive self-interference cancellation feedback. So right between the antenna interface and the duplexer, we added this shunted uh, tunable devices. And if we can carefully tune the bias voltage of these devices, these devices will generate extra reflections, which can cancel out with the original reflection from the antenna interface. So overall, we don't have significant leakage from the RX port. And because the uh, antenna mismatch or reflection is dispersive uh, for different frequency, we really cannot afford to always manually tune this bias voltage of the devices. So what we do instead is we add a feedback loop. So now uh, when the antenna mismatch changes over frequency, the bias voltage of these devices will change accordingly, automatically, and uh, it will always well compensate out uh, with the original antenna reflection. So uh, to show you the intuition of the closed loop behavior, this is a behavioral simulation result. You can see that uh, once the instantaneous frequency is moving along one FMCW chirp, at that specific instantaneous frequency, we always have a good isolation. And this whole procedure is a dynamic process. Okay, so this is the overall system topology of this chip, and this is the die photo. This is the system assembly, and because we're using frontside radiation, uh, we can pair the system with a large-scale 3D printed planar lens. In a measurement, indeed, we see that due to this monostatic operation, we have a perfect beam alignment between the TX beam and the RX beam, and this is exactly what we want to see. And because we have this adaptive FIC feedback, we can further compress down the leakage in average about 8.3 dB. And if, if we add this number with the original isolation level of our duplexer structure, uh, overall, we can achieve uh, around 33.3 dB of isolation. These two videos shows the actual FMCW radar demo uh, for this transceiver. On the left, uh, you can see that if we put an object in front of the radar, then on this detection spectrum, you will see a clear detected peak, which represents a target located at uh, 74 centimeter away from the radar. And this 74 centimeter is exactly what we measured for the physical distance. And this basically shows you the range detection, so one dimension. And if you put your hand in front of the radar, this peak disappears. This is because your hand is like an absorber for sub terahertz waves. And then on the right side, you see that if we can further move this target in front of the radar back and forth, then uh, you can use Doppler effect to further detect the velocity of this object. So you can do a 2D Fourier transform generating this 2D spectrum. In the vertical axis, you still see the range information, but now on the horizontal axis, you can also get the velocity information. So this is another dimension of radar detection. So this is the comparison uh, between our work and the other state-of-the-art monostatic radars. In here, you can see that uh, compared to other works, we are the only one that achieving larger than 30 dB of isolation, but without any inherent 6 dB coupler loss. And we are using frontside radiation scheme, uh, which can be paired with the 3D printed planar lens, and we achieve the highest total radiative power. Okay, so as for the conclusions, Essentially, in this talk, uh, we present a uh, new scenario for 4D uh, radar imaging at sub terahertz with high angular resolution. So we decouple this original problem into two sets of 2D problems. And uh, for one set of the problem, we demonstrate a 260 gigahertz CMOS reflector rate, uh, which can do this uh, one degree resolution 2D beam steering in both azimuth and elevation. And then uh, for the range and velocity uh, detection, and also for the feeding structure of the reflector rate, we demonstrate another monostatic transceiver work. 
And this work uh, used EM mode based approach to separate the TX and RX signals in the duplexer. And we can achieve a good isolation without any 6 dB coupler loss. So as you can imagine, if we uh, further combine these two works together in the future, an uh, all silicon compact 40 terahertz imaging radar with one degree angular resolution should be feasible. Uh, we would like to thank a lot of people, uh, beginning with our collaborators listed in here. We would like to thank Virginia Dials and Professor Dirk England for the instrument support. We would like to thank Intel University shuttle team and advanced packaging team for the chip fabrication. And lastly, we would like to thank our fund supports. That's all of my talk. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, CB, for the for the talk. So now the uh, talk is open to questions. Uh, I don't see uh, people put question in the Q and A panel in here. Uh, so maybe you can just uh, raise up your uh, virtual hand and uh, directly ask the uh, ask CB the questions. Any question? So maybe while we are waiting for the questions, uh, Shibi, um, I have one for you, uh, which is sure. uh, you basically show two work, right? Uh, one is at a higher frequency and then the other one is at a lower frequency. So when you eventually combine them together, what kind of uh, challenges do you foresee? Uh, I think like uh, the, major, the major challenge is, uh, you know, when you pair these two uh, together, uh, you need to consider uh, whether the mechanism we use in this transceiver uh, is still feasible once you have another refractory pairing with it. Uh, so in that case, like uh, you need to you need to think about uh, 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 whether whether you know uh, you can you can really uh, you know use this uh, full duplex uh, mechanism with this large uh, pairing with this large scale uh, uh, refractory. So I think that's the major uh, difficulty. Okay. Any other question for CB? All right. So uh, if there's no more uh, question, uh, so I would like to thank the speaker again uh, on behalf of all the audience in here. Thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, so that concludes uh, this talk. Uh, I would also like to uh, remind everyone that uh, uh, we'll continue our, our uh, uh, MIT Nano exploration. Uh, the next talk is going to be, uh, let me see in here. The next talk is going to be November 8th um, on Tuesday and by uh, Guo Qing Wang from the uh, Nuclear Science and Engineering Department of MIT. So uh, please join that talk if you're interested. Thank you.